We're going to turn to Romans chapter 14, please. These are three passages that you want to mark down, which is very effective concerning, again, Seventh-day Adventism or Hebrew Roots Movement or Judaism or any other false religion that might teach you have to observe the Sabbath. So I want you to mark these three places down. So we're going to turn to Galatians 4, Romans 14, and Colossians 2. These are the three famous passages that are used to prove that we do not have to observe certain days. It's not a big deal to the Lord. The Sabbaths are not a big issue to God. Okay, so we're going to turn to three places, Colossians 2, Galatians 4, and Romans chapter 14. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you these verses that prove it, and then mostly in this Bible study tonight, I'm going to show you the counter-arguments. So this is going to be more apologetic. So if you're into that studying apologetics, then you're going to like tonight. If you're like, oh boy, argument back and forth on this one, just bear with me because one day some Seventh-day Adventist yeah. might invite you to church. Yeah. Or maybe a black Hebrew Israelite too, you know, on the street. So you never know. Might come out. All right, so let's look at Romans chapter 14. We'll read verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. Uh, he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. So this can include Seventh-day Adventists who... <laughs> excuse me, who exclaim so much and stress so much concerning being a vegetarian. So you'll notice that in these three passages right here, it doesn't matter what your diet is or what day you observe. Sunday is paganism. Well, it doesn't matter to God what day you observe. The point is, is that you're observing it to the Lord. Amen. You're observing it to the Lord. And by the way, anything that you look up in life, you're going to find something pagan in it. Right. Didn't you know they even mix fabric and then... Uh, cutting your hair uh, short on the side, that, that, that's what pagans did back then? That's found in the book of Leviticus. book of Leviticus, it shows that. So you'll notice right here, that doesn't matter. Anything nowadays, Satan has corrupted. You're going to understand that. So that's, that's why it's important to make sure where your heart is at concerning to the Lord. All right, Galatians, now keep your hand at all three places. We're going to keep going there. Galatians 4, 9 through 10. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. Notice that this is again weak, beggarly elements, observing days again. Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. Well, that's a weak element, God calls it. That's bondage. Okay, let's also turn to Colossians 2. Keep your hand at all three places, remember. Colossians 2, 14. We'll, look, we'll start at verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the what? Sabbath. Sabbath days. Why? Because it's blotted out by the cross, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All right, so we notice that in these three passages... This totally debunks the idea concerning about the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. And then God says that, no, it's not a big issue right here concerning the Sabbath. There are three passages that debunk this. We saw Romans chapter 14. And then we also saw Galatians chapter 4. And then we also saw uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2 is especially strong. Now, you bet your boots that... These different cults, they know these three passages. So they will come up with arguments to debunk these three passages right here. You might say, how so, Pastor? Well, let's start off with Romans chapter 14. What they will argue right here is that uh, Paul is criticizing the observance of eating days, not the Sabbaths. So in other words, the reason why he was saying it doesn't matter which day you observe, is because during back in those times, so then cults will always pull up some kind of historical context. Remember that. That is a highlight. All right? 
You're going to notice that with some people who pretend that they're smart, but they absolutely have no idea what they're talking about. They just borrowed it from some kind of blog or their pastor who didn't even graduate from a really good school either. So you got to understand this, is that these people, they're just borrowing ideas. So remember this, anyone can pick up whatever historical story that they want to conjure up their own interpretation. And if you don't believe me, put that guy in a room with 10 others, how they interpret their historical context on that verse, and you'll prove that they're biased. All right, now anyways, they're going to argue right here, it's the observance of eating days, not Sabbaths, not Sabbaths. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it not to the Lord. Why? Because it's the same context with he that eateth, eateth to the Lord. So during those days, back in history, there were certain people who followed these ideas of certain days to celebrate concerning certain festivals and feasts and meals that they should eat. So they were observing feast days, not the Sabbath days. Blah, 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 blah. That's what they're going to talk about. Now, what you point out to them is that you got to point out to them how they're biased in selecting historical context. Now, here's another thing right here. The verse itself disproves that. Look at verse 3. The Bible specifically divided the eating diet and the days into two different things in separate verses, not the one and the same idea. So you notice that the Seventh-day Adventists, or whoever these people were, what they're, what they're trying to do is combine the idea. Let's simplify this. Review. We argue it doesn't matter what you eat and what, you, and what day you observe, right? That's what Paul was talking about. He's talking about it doesn't matter what meal you eat or what day you observe. Those are the two issues. Seventh-day Adventists, what they're trying to do is that they're trying to make them, no, 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 no. It's eating days, festivals, certain feasts. Okay, that's what they're trying to point out right here. See the wording? Now, the debunking to this is that it's not mashed potatoing and milkshaking these two things together. Remember, that's the context of anti-dispensationalists. They always like to combine things together. They don't divide things to proper context. No, the Bible specifically shows, no, it's talking about two separate issues here. Look at the verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. See, judging them by the meal that they eat. And notice a separate verse right here, a separate verse, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Look at that, observing the days. So Paul was talking about two separate issues right here. What are you going to do when I say, okay, we're going to meet at church at uh, Wednesday night. Oh, by the way, when you go downstairs to eat, eat, make sure that you take your food home. You're going to mash potato the two together and say, pastor said that at Wednesday night we got to take our food home. No, we don't bring food Wednesday night Bible study. That's the mentality of, let's be honest, that's the mentality of stupidity right there. Now, why am I really hitting them hard because they act smart so that they can put pressure on you. But you got to realize this, their wis the wisdom of men is actually folly and foolishness. You notice this mentality that they're doing? That's foolishness. That is stupidity. That's not being smart by historical context. And during, during those days, there were certain rabbis and certain Jew Jewish traditions and blah, 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 like that. Just ignore 90% of what you hear on that one. And then catch what they're basically driving at. Okay, let's also look at verse 4. Verse 4. You know what I slam against? I slam against people who try to act smart, but, and then they use that intelligence to deceive you. When you actually look at the core and raw basics, you realize, well, that's just actually nonsense. Yeah. Same thing with evolution. Oh, you are all born from a rock, but... Atheists will say, no, that's not what we said. You're lying, you're lying. And then they give all these scientific jargons and terminology that goes three paragraphs long. And then basically the translation is, yeah, we're all born from a rock. That's what it means. Okay, so let's look at Romans chapter 14 and verse 4. 
Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or fallen. Yea, he shall be holding him up, for God is able to make him stand. Notice, more than just eating and days, you know what Paul was talking about right here? He's talking about all kinds of issues. Everyone has their own conviction in life. And you got to understand this. If it's the Word of God, there is no such thing as different convictions. It's Scripture. But where Scripture is silent and you have a different conviction, you got to realize this. Paul says that everyone has different convictions, so you got to realize you can't judge on that. So if you want to limit this to only festivals, you ruin the whole context of Romans 14 by its historical and proper eisegesis context. All right, you'll notice verse 6. See that? You'll notice verse 10. See that? Look at verse 13. See that? All of this is ju being judgmental about different kinds of things. And Paul is saying you don't have to be judgmental on all kinds of different issues. Everyone has their own conviction between them and God. Okay, let's also turn to Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. Now, this is what they're going to argue for this one. What they're going to argue right here is that when Paul talks about bondage, he is referring to... <laughs> I can't believe what I'm reading right here. So the specific days, so this one was an eating day. This one is a pagan days. So this is not Jewish Sabbath. It's talking about pagan days right here. You notice right here where the Bible says days, they just want to insert whatever interpretation they want after that. Yeah. Pagan days, man. Might as well put Christmas right here or your birthday, you know. Might as well put whatever you want over there. But here's the thing is that, so... This is their inserting their own interpretation. So they're going to say Paul is criticizing pagans in being bondage to pagan days, such as astrology, not, not on Jewish Sabbaths. Well, where did you get that idea from? Well, anyway, let's just read the passage. Let's humor them. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Notice it reads right here. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. See that? He's talking to Galatians, right? Galatians, what they were back then, they were pagans. So see, Paul was condemning at verse 9 their lifestyle in paganism. Obviously not being Jews. So at verse 10, Paul is condemning them not for the Jewish days, Seventh-day Adventists will argue. It was referring to pagan days. See, that's how they will argue. Now, the problem with this interpretation is that you're going to, we're going <laughs> to, they're not going to like this. Go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. What we argue right here is that Galatians is referring to the Sabbath days right here, or Jewish days. But then the Seventh-day Adventists, what they're going to argue right here is that, no, it's referring to pagan days. Well, then they're going to bring a problem right here. This is worse for them. This, our explanation made it worse for them. Why? It's not just a festival. It's all kinds of issues. Not even just a day or a meal, but all kinds of issues. That made it worse for them. They did the same thing. It made it worse for them. It's not just Sabbath days or Jewish days. It's the whole Old T law right here, the Old Testament law. Oops. What are they going to do now? <laughs> That just made things worse for them. Okay, look at verse 3. Even so, when we were children, we were what? Bondage under the elements of the world. Remember, Paul was talking about being bondage to the weak, beggarly elements, to the days, right? Now, what is he talking about in context? Let's keep reading. Verse 8. Uh, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. Okay, so we see right here that it can refer to paganism right here. But now let's continue reading. Let's look at verse 9. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So they're going back into bondage again. Hmm. Verse 10, the observance of days, months, times, and years. Okay, what is this returning to bondage? Let's keep reading. 
Look at verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be what? Under the law. Do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a what? Bond maid. The other by a free woman. Ah, oh, look at this. So this bondage is going to go be referring to the Old Testament law here. But let's keep reading. Look at verse uh, 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from where? Mount Sinai. There's your bondage. The bondwoman. Mount Sinai. Where did the Ten Commandments come from? The Old Testament law. Mount Sinai. Which gendereth to bondage. Well, that's plain. The law is bondage then. Which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. That's plainly the bondage. But look at chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is this? Verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the what? Whole law. Verse 4, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the what? Law. That's plain. That's plain. You got that? The bondage is to the law. Now, Paul, he did say, we recognize verse 8, that Gentiles were once under bondage by paganism. But here's the idea. Paul is also pointing out right here the context of the idea concerning bondage to observances right here, like a ritual, a law right here. So we take it for granted that for verse 8, this is talking about what they were used to be, bondage to the pagan law. But then when Paul says at verse 9, they turn again to bondage to the law, He's saying this, they are turning again to bondage to the law, but this time it's not to paganism. What they're turning bondage again to the law is Judaism. How is that proven? We saw that, chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. We saw chapter 4, verse 21 through 25. Those uh, Gentiles were going back to the bondage of the law under Judaism. See, the law, Old Testament law. <coughs> so that's the answer right there. Now, another thing right here, mm, yeah, I'm just going to mention this quickly, but this is definitely proven when you look at the entire historic, you want to argue historical context and eisegesis, what you got to do is, look, read the entire book of Galatians, and you'll find out, if you're an honest person, the Galatians did not have trouble with paganism. That wasn't the root issue. It was Judaism. It was the Jewish law. So these Seventh-day Adventists, why are they trying to uh, become a Jew? Why are the Hebrew Roots Movement trying to become a Jew? Black Hebrew Israelites becoming a Jew. They're far from being a Jew. <laughs> what do you mean you're a Jew? <laughs> so the idea, G Jesus was black. The 12 tribes of Israel were black. What is that kind of nonsense? Oh, you're being a racist. You laugh at me if I said Jesus was Korean and his 12 <laughs> tribes were Korean. Yeah, I'm a racist. Okay, anyways. See, look, the idea is this. They were Jews, okay? What is a Jew? Really? A Jew, okay? I mean, even secular lost people know that, okay? What do you write, at your, what do you write in your legal documents, huh? I'm a Jew? Or are you more honest? I'm an African American. I'm a Korean. I'm an Asian American, et cetera, et cetera. Aren't you more honest that way? Don't, don't say you're a Jew. No, no, no. Let's look at your legal documents right here. I don't see an officer, you know, say, I mean, there's a Jew running, you know, when there's some Korean or different race running. Come on. Grow up. Grow up. Grow up. I'm not being a racist. We have black people in our church. We have Jews in our church. And yeah, you have this Korean and several more Koreans in our church. Okay, so grow up, okay? Grow up. Okay, chapter 2, verse 12 through 21. Chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, and verses 10 through 13. 17 through 19, chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. The whole context was Paul criticizing bondage to the Jewish law. That's so obvious. It is not paganism. Okay, let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 14. All right, this is going to be fun. You ready for this one? This, what, what an interpretation. Seventh-day Adventists. Now, this is a more common argument from them. So you're going to hear this more specifically. 
What they're going to argue for Colossians 2, when this is a powerful verse where you disprove the Sabbath days. But what they're going to argue right here, this is more common among them, they're going to say what Christ blotted out was the record of our sins, not the Old Testament law at the cross. That's what they're going to argue. So that's more unified. That's being more honest right there. If you're going to be more dishonest, this is their argument. Some of them argue this way. Paul is not talking about annual Sabbaths, but weekly Sabbaths. Oh, come on. Seriously? You're going to go that far? This is so much of a stretch. You see this? I don't like this intellectual argument. It shows more dishonesty, incongruence with them. I really don't like that. You want to hear another one right here? This is more dishonest. Look, the one that I'll acknowledge is blotting out the record of our sins on the cross. Look, I'm being fair. That one is a more honest argument from a Seventh-day Adventist. It's more unified. You'll see several of them arguing that. But, to, but these kind of arguments, I guarantee this. You're going to see Seventh-day Adventists contradicting each other with these following ones. Annual Sabbath, not weekly Sabbath. <laughs> Grow up, man. Here's another one. Paul could be criticizing Gnostics who judge on how the Christians do not practice aestheticism on the Sabbath, not observing the Sabbath itself. Oh, so how they observe the Sabbath was criticized, not the Sabbath itself was criticized. That's the basic English for it. <laughs> you see this dishonesty? I really don't like this. Okay, now let's cover their more legitimate argument. So this is legitimate. This seems more legitimate. We're going to look at verse 13. Okay, so 14, he blotted out the ordinances against us, which included, we argue, verse 16, the Sabbath. But in verse 14, what he blotted out was verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircum uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. See? So this seems to be like a record against your sins right here. Now that one I will give them the more honest benefit of the doubt. So the Seventh-day Adventist argument is that it's the record of our sins. Now, this is more simple than you think. You ready for this? It's not that hard. What is the record of your sins, folks? The law. <laughs> there you go. There's your answer. Wow, much more simple than you thought, right? Because remember at Romans chapter 7, if you read your Bible, but let's turn to, I'll show you a better one than that. Go to Ephesians, okay, Ephesians. But if you remember your Bible reading at Romans chapter 7, what was Paul talking about that recorded our sins, That was the handwriting that was against us? It's the law. God judged you by the law, how much you broke it. Ah. But to definitely prove this, is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. Remember, the handwriting of ordinances against us. That's what God blotted out, right? Is that the Old Testament law? Yes. Ephesians 2, 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the what? Law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. See what he took care of by the cross? The cross got rid of the law right here. See, there's your answer. There's your answer. So actually, this is an argument from us, not from them. This is proven by Ephesians chapter 2. Now, their weekly Sabbath, annual Sabbath, that's just totally ridiculous, so I'm not going to even turn to the verses, but I'm going to give it to you. That way you can study it for yourself. Oh, by the way, uh, if you'll notice at, uh, back at Colossians 2, when you see verse 16, he says, therefore, let no man therefore. You know what therefore means? As a result. So as a result of verse 14 at Colossians 2, the law was blotted out. As a result, what? Don't let anyone judge you about the Sabbath days. There, that's what we argue. That's a more honest interpretation. Okay, aside from that, okay, their argument for uh, annual Sabbath, not weekly Sabbath, is found at Hosea chapter 2, verse 11. So that's the Seventh-day Adventist proof text, Hosea 2, verse 11, about their annual or weekly stuff. 
But the argument against that is just because the new moon and the feasts are mentioned, so it seems to show like a annual Sabbath rather than weekly, neither of those two verses actually said that the Sabbath has to be annual or weekly or for that matter. It just said Sabbath. So use your head. If it says Sabbath, what does that mean? It doesn't matter if it's weekly or annual. It's all Sabbath then. It means as it says. But Hosea actually shows, their proof text of Hosea actually shows that Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2 through 3, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2 through 3, that the Sabbath has to be weekly with the feasts, with their annual feasts. So that just debunks that argument. But here's a, here, you want a more plainer one than that? This is more plain. If you look at Colossians 2.16, what does it say? Sabbath days. How about that? So that's a weekly Sabbath right there. That's a weekly Sabbath, not something annual. By the way, if you look up the term Sabbath days in your Bible, you know what that refers to? Weekly Sabbath. This would fail to include Matthew 12, verse 5, verse 10, verse 12, Mark 3, verse 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 31, Luke chapter 6, verse 2, verse 9, Acts chapter 17, verse 2, and et cetera, et cetera, with a lot of exclamation points at the end. <laughs> All right. Another thing right here is that, so their other ridiculous argument concerning historical context is, it's some, it could be about the Gnostics judging the Christians about aestheticism during those days at the Sabbath and how they observe the Sabbath, blah, 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 blah. Now, the simple debunking to that is, if you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, and verse 18, as well as verse 20 through 23, you'll notice right here what Paul was condemning right here. What Paul was condemning right here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and then verse 18, and then verse 20 through 23, what he's condemning right here was in verse 16, let no man therefore judge you what? In meat, or how do we eat? In meat, in drink, or in respect of the holy day. So you'll notice right here, it's not, he's not, God is not, uh, God is not saying here, let no man judge you how you observe the days. It's in the day itself. It's in those things itself. That's what you've got to understand right here. Although he mentions right here concerning about verses 18 and 20 through 23, he does mention right here concerning about the, the weird Gnosticism that's strangely spreading out. What you're going to find out right here is that if you look at verse 20, You'll, you'll notice, are ye subject to what? Ordinances. Remember, what's the ordinances? The Old Testament law, remember? See, it's the Old Testament law right here. It's not concerning about how they practiced it in those days and connecting it to Gnostics. That's fairy tale la-la land that they made up, just like Greek and Hebrew and evolution. Like, they always make up things. So these are the arguments that you can use to, debate, to do apologetics with uh, Hebrew roots, black Hebrew Israelite, Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever. But mostly you'll find this with Seventh-day Adventists.